This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me all right? I've been testing this out, but... Okay, great. You, you'll notice that the title on your handout is not the same and much more boring, and so please refer to my actual, actual title, Welcome with Open Arms, which I hope is immediately apparent and appropriate. I have to quickly take a quick survey. How many people, if you saw somebody doing this, <laughs> would know what that was, vaguely or otherwise? Most people? Okay, but not everybody. For your information, this is Frankenstein's monster, as is known to all children on the planet. You've obviously been occupying your minds with greater thoughts. <laughs> I, too, would like to thank the organizers of this conference for bringing us all together. And as always, when working on a Plutarch-related topic, I end up learning a great deal more than I expected and go down some unexpected paths. In what follows, I am not trying to enter the scholarly fray on the reception of Mary Shelley, who's, whom feminists in particular are redeeming as an original and important author and thinker. I'm concerned here only with the intersection of Plutarch's lives, or at least some of them, with her great work, Einstein, the modern Prometheus. But as a biographer interested in biographers, I must provide a certain amount of deep background for our discussion. This next sentence strikes me in view of the great papers we've been hearing as kind of hilariously um, not informational. We are fortunate that Plutarch's popularity in Europe has been almost unbroken. <laughs> And we can trace scholars using or referring to Plutarch's work throughout most of the medieval and Renaissance periods. I believe that has now been settled. <laughs> Along with ancient history in general, Plutarch's work was widely known and appreciated by even Americans during the early days of our new nation, founded in 1776 and, when last checked, going strong. Among those many who appreciated Plutarch's works were the so-called U.S. Founding Fathers, the collective name for a group of U.S. statesmen, including Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, among many others. These individuals collectively hammered out a series of foundation documents for their new nation, including the so-called Federalist Essays, which appeared in prominent Northeastern newspapers in the U.S in the latter part of the 18th century. Those essays were meant to persuade readers to vote in favor of ratifying a proposed constitution, mainly by outlining what the new government would be like. But my interest lies almost a generation later, where we can find another window on Plutarch's works in the novel Frankenstein Prometheus by Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin Shelley, 97 to 1851, and in this book play a large role. Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin Shelley, and all those names are important, although we will go right to Mary Shelley, was known to politically active reform, she was, pardon me, born to politically active reformist parents. Her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, was the well-known author of A Vindication of the Rights of Women, written in 1792, four years before Mary's birth. I beg your indulgence, but any references I give you are going to come at the bibliography at the end in alphabetical order. And so the handout itself, I'm afraid you have to look at the end for the bibliography. Vindication of the Rights of Women was foundational in feminist studies, very well received on its publication. Later, it fell into disrepute when after the author's death in childbirth with Mary in 1797, her widower, Godwin, chose to publish a memoir which included many lurid details about their scandalous life, including her multiple suicide attempts, extramarital affairs, out-of-wedlock daughter, I say as a biographer, think twice about these memoirs on behalf of other people. Godwin, one of the founders of the anarchist movement, Mary Shelley's father, wrote other things as well as this memoir. 
Handout 1. From the back cover of the current Broadview paperback edition comes the following summary of Godwin's St. Leon. Set in Europe during the Protestant Reformation and first published in 1799, St. Leon tells the story of an impoverished aristocrat who obtains the philosopher's stone and the elixir of immortality. In this philosophical fable, endless riches and immortal life prove to be curses rather than gifts and transform St. Leon into an outcast. William Godwin's second full-length novel then explores the predicament of a would-be philanthropist whose attempts to benefit humanity are frustrated by superstition and ignorance. I hope my foreshadowing here on the novel Frankenstein is very heavy. In 1812, when Mary was 16, she met Percy Shelley and his then wife, Harriet. A year and a half later, in June 1814, Mary eloped with Percy, who still married, this is complicated, to the continent, her stepsister Claire in tow. It is at this time that she and Percy evidently encountered Burg Frankenstein, an old Frankish stronghold near Darmstadt, Germany. The most famous Frankenstein is still considered to be Georg, and I'm sorry, I'm inadvertently saying Frankenstein because we all know why of the Mel Brooks movie. Naturally, it is correctly pronounced Frankenstein. Uh, the most famous then, Georg von Frankenstein, who died killing a dragon in 1531. Authors note solemnly, this was probably a poisonous snake. Killjoys. He became known later as Saint Georg, but everyone agrees not that one. Over the centuries, the castle periodically found itself in territory that was hotly disputed, periodically falling under Ottoman rule. In one of these astonishing intersections, Vlad III, the Impaler, 1431-76, to and future model for Bram Stoker's Dracula, was instrumental in recovering the territory. Fans know that Frankenstein versus X is a whole series of terrible movies, and there's lots of Frankenstein versus Dracula. I was astonished to find out this might be yet another formerly unemployed classicist somehow trying to unite traditions. At any rate, the Frankenstein castle was stole, sold to the state in 1662 and bought by one Johann Conrad Dippel, an innkeeper there, who renamed himself quickly Baron von Frankenstein. One of his teachers said of Dippel that if Dippel were given the recipe for a pudding, he would write a cookbook. This was meant as a, <laughs> this was meant as a criticism because I briefly had one of those attacks of inferiority. Dang, I gotta get on this. He styled himself Baron von Frankenstein and conducted many experiments claiming to have discovered the elixir of life, which he marketed as Dippel's oil, a noxious combination of animal remains and chemicals. Uh, I am able to supply you with the exact chemical breakdown of this if you're interested, but I don't advise it. It's really disgusting. This, <laughs> this thing was in use until the 1900s, so what can I say? Rumors abounded about Dippel's experiments with reanimating cadavers. Surely these experiments were known to the students of the University of Strasbourg, Dippel's alma mater, with whom Percy and Mary passed a lot of time while at Darmstadt. Mary would not wed Shelley legally until December 1816, when Percy's estranged yet pregnant wife, and that's actually a very sad story. Percy abandoned her. She had to turn to prostitution. This did not seem to concern him. She conveniently, that's not fair, she committed suicide, freeing Percy to marry, Mar Mary, to wed Mary, which he did immediately to give him that. By then, Mary had been, work, had been at work on Frankenstein for about six months after she, Percy, and other members of a bored and drained out holiday party in Geneva, Switzerland, were challenged by Lord Byron to write their own ghost stories. One of this group, Dr. John Polidori, hired as personal physician to Lord Byron, but turning out, in fact, to be a sad and aspirational hanger-on who ultimately killed himself with prussic acid, 
that matters from the Dipples oil thing, but we're not going to talk about that, is credited on the same occasion with having written the first vampire story called The Vampire, whose eponymous protagonist was evidently modeled after Byron himself. It will be worth remembering when we get there that Polidori was a graduate of Edinburgh University, famed for its anatomists. Rained out in terms of this holiday party is a misleading term, since this was the famous year without a summer, after Mount Tambora's massive eruption in Indonesia the year before, 1815. Temperatures dropped, food was scarce, nature had become unnatural. The rather unwilling house party had been entertaining itself with various gruesome stories and recitations, as one would. I say unwilling because it was about at this point that Mary's half-sister Claire, who had tagged along with them in order to stay close to Lord Byron, on whom she was fixated, revealed that she was in fact pregnant with Lord Byron's child. Lord Byron was not best pleased, and in fact resorted to time-honored reactions like doubting paternity, quote, is the brat mine, uh, and refusing to cough up any monetary support. This depressed and depressing forced proximity brought on other troubles. Polidori's journal records that during or just after Byron's recitation of Coleridge's Christabel, featuring Return of the Reanimated Dead and Witches, Percy Shelley became very upset, and time prevented me from including the text of this poem, but I highly recommend it, Christabel by Coleridge. Uh, Percy becomes upset. Quote, later that evening, Polidori jotted in his diary, June 18th, Lord Byron repeated some verses of Coleridge's Christabel about the witch's breasts. When silence ensued and Shelley, suddenly shrieking and putting his hands to his head, ran out of the room with a candle, threw water in his face, and after gave him ether. That's what you want. He had been looking at Mrs. Shelley and suddenly thought of a woman he had heard of who had eyes instead of nipples, which taking hold of his mind terrified him. In fact, Shelley had suffered from such waking dreams all his life, being found in bed screaming with his eyes open but unable to be woken in the classic way of night terrors. Interestingly, Mary Shelley later claimed, I say claimed because this is not really what scholars seem to think now, that she had the Frankenstein story occur to her all at once in a waking dream. Seems less likely, as I say, but what is likely is that the character of Victor Frankenstein himself was modeled at least to some extent on Percy himself, whose Oxford room was full of strange scientific equipment. I don't think they let you do this anymore, but I haven't had the nerve to experiment perfect personally. This is uh, Shelley's friend and biographer, Thomas Jefferson Hogg, described how Shelley, quote, proceeded with much eagerness and enthusiasm to show me the various instruments, especially the electrical apparatuses, turning round the handle very rapidly so that the fierce crackling sparks flew forth. Afterwards, he charged a powerful battery of several large jars, laboring with vast energy and discoursing with increasing vehemence of the marvelous powers of electricity, of thunder and lightning, describing an electrical kite that he had had made at home and projecting another and an enormous one, or rather a combination of many kites that would draw, that should be down from the sky, an immense volume of electricity, the whole ammunition of a mighty thunderstorm, and this being directed to some point would there produce the most stupendous results. One result was when a porter attempted to interfere with him, got a hand in the battery which was arcing and got blown several feet backwards. I think this had at least as much to do with his uh, rustication as the atheism treatise to be uh, fair. Uh, Shelley's private scientific inquiry fit in very well with the intellectual enthusiasms of the day. Montillo, in your bibliography, gives excellent backgrounds on this, particularly in chapters one, The Spark of Life, and two, Waking the Dead, carefully delineating the obsession with the works of Cornelius Agrippa, Paracelsus, and Albertus Magnus. 
of particular interest, I guess I should say to me anyway, is the preoccupation with galvanism, the ap application of electricity to possibly or formerly soon to be inanimate material to see what happens. Galvanism leads to the rise of the resurrection men, grave robbers who dug up and sold corpses to doctors for anatomical exhibitions, and even worse, executed criminals or criminals about to be executed could be sentenced to these anatomists, which meant their bodies would be publicly mutilated, dissected, dismembered, sometimes in order to attempt reanimation by electricity. So you got to think about that for a while. Rumors were rife about the possibility of waking up on the anatomist table, in which case the procedure evidently was to hang the hanged individuals and then take up where the procedure left off. The most famous of these resurrectionists, or sack em up men, was surely Burke and Hare, who branched out into murder in order to obtain good corpses for resale to physicians on the black market. Supposedly, they perfected a technique of suffocation that left no marks, which became known as burking. When Burke himself was caught and sentenced to be hanged, the crowd chanted, burk him, burk him. Uh, he himself got sentenced to the anatomist also, which is one of those what goes around comes around moments. Ultimately, the Anatomy Act of 1832 created a system of inspection and, for lack of a better term, provenance for all cadavers and required licensing of anatomists and so the usefulness of resurrection men for procuring corpses just evaporated. Mary was widowed in 1822, as all friends of University College Oxford know, Percy drowned in a boating accident. Mary continued to write, including two revised editions of Frankenstein, until her death in 1850 from a brain tumor. As far as the novel Frankenstein goes, I honestly believe that little background is necessary despite our multinational makeup. I hope the open arms reference is now clear. To be thorough, however, brief review is in order. Dr. Victor Frankenstein became interested in occult works of alchemy and created a monster by reanimating a grisly and enormous assemblage of body parts. Dr. Frankenstein immediately, and I mean on the spot, abandoned his creation in fright and disgust. The lonely and terrified monster tried to join civilization, only to be rejected again for his hideous appearance. He took horrible revenge on his maker, who pursued the creature across the Arctic ice. The monster lured Dr. Frankenstein to his death and then disappeared to a self-inflicted death in order to spare the world. This novel is constructed in Chinese box or Russian doll fashion. The work is framed by letters to his sister from the captain of an icebreaker who encounters the weak and desperate Victor in pursuit of his monster. As Victor tells his story, almost Odysseus style, the central set piece comes into focus, namely the story of the monster in his own words, his travails, despair, anger, and vengeance. It was an immediate sensation, this book, and has been adapted and readapted many times in the almost 200 years since its publication. And it pains me more than I can say that there is not time for a lengthy exposition of the many lurid treatments by Hollywood alone on the subject. I have spent some time thinking about how to work young Frankenstein into this paper. Fans will tell me later if I was successful, but I digress. Back to the monster. <laughs> Rejected and alone, the monster educated himself by observing life around him and teaching himself to read. A great deal of his story concerns his encountering the de Lacy family in the woods and spying on them. I mean, he can't be seen, particularly as the younger members of the group are being homeschooled. The monster longed to join them and their family, but he had become aware of how repulsive his appearance made him. One day by chance, he found a satchel containing a small but power-packed library. 
Plutarch's Lives, Milton's Paradise Lost, Goethe's Sorrows of Young Werther, a collection described in handout three by the Norton Critical Edition is providing expertise in, quote, German sentiment, ancient heroism, and satanic sturdiness. And I'll let you figure out which is which. <laughs> in the Cambridge Companion to Mary Shelley, the editor E. Shore, handout four, observes such progressive reading matter not only transforms the creature's sense of himself, but also equips him to launch a vigorous critique of Frankenstein's actions in both public and private spheres. In other words, Victor's ethics. For modern scholarship on the novel centers largely on its ethical aspects, as the series of quotations in handout five from the Cambridge Companion makes clear. From the feminist perspective, which has dominated discussion of Frankenstein in the last decade, this is first and foremost a book about what happens when a man tries to procreate without a woman. We know from the story of Pasiphae and the Minotaur, among others, what happens when women try to procreate without men. It's just not good. I guess it really is the same old story. We hear also Mary Shelley's dream thus gives rise to a central theme of the novel, Victor Frankenstein's total failure as a parent. I am not mocking any of these people. I am, I am suggesting that we all have our own interpretation of the novel and that's part of its greatness or its legacy. Uh, I'll skip the next few quotes. The monster's education is a big deal and the books he had very few, meaning the author's choice, Shelley, was particularly significant. Had Mary Shelley herself read Plutarch, Milton, and Goethe? We can consult the elaborate reading lists kept by Mary, and these lists almost led me alone, they're on them on their own, to make a PowerPoint because it is astonishing. She recorded what she and Percy were reading all the time. And the brilliant people in your bibliography who did work on this website have split the list out so you can check it alphabetically by author, chronologically by when the Shelleys are reading. This made it very easy for me to draw some of the observations you see next. We can consult this list and see that she had read, forgive me, I'm an historian, or claimed she had, Goethe in 1850, Paradise Lost in 1815, 1816, 1819, 1820. She read Plutarch's Lives, or some of them, in 1815. The choices of Milton and Goethe are easy to understand, favorite texts as they were for the Romantics. But why did Shelley choose Plutarch? What was their affinity? Handout six, Gold Hill, in a flawed but stimulating chapter on the value of Greek, why save Plutarch, sums up the monster's reading by assigning Milton for religious understanding and Goethe for sentimental education. But for an education into politics and history, says Gold Hill, there is Plutarch's lives. Plutarch, like Milton or Goethe, can sum up a whole world of Western knowing, a stupendous, please correct to body, of work, which has the power to make the monster transcend himself. One problem with this outlook is how few of those lives were actually in play. The monster tells us that he is happy to have discovered books in French. I quote Mary, fortunately the books were written in the language the elements of which I had acquired at the cottage, says the monster. He has been learning French along with Safi, a young Turkish girl on the run. He's been learning from Lacey who are in exile in Germany, think Darmstadt, because of helping Safi's treacherous Turkish father, Darmstadt, Ottoman invasions. Here again comes a truly otiose observation. Did Plutarch exist in French? Sorry. I wrote this before. Of course, in the Amio translation, among others, of 1559, what about Milton and Goethe? Yes and yes, with the latter also available in English by 1779. But the monster only refers to a few lives, as we'll see shortly, those of Numa, Solon, Lycurgus, Romulus, and Theseus. 
In fact, volume one of Amyo's 1559 translation contains only those lives plus the opposite number to Solon, Poplicola, and the comparison for each pair. This is true also for North's 1579 translation. By 1683, Dryden includes more lives in his volume one, adding Themistocles, Camillus, Pericles, Fabius, and the comparison, as does Langhorne in 1770. So whatever Mary herself read or heard about Plutarch, the monster is evidently limited to only these six lives mentioned. And this throws a little cold water on any suggestion that the monster was influenced by the whole of Plutarch's work, as suggested by many. And it took me quite a while to suddenly, took me quite a while to come to the realization that when I was seeing Plutarch's lives, which I automatically see the whole roster run through my mind, but no, this is some of them only, not all. It is also clear, if Mary's reading list is to be believed, that she had read all three of the monster's textbooks in 1815, not too long before the ghost story contest began. And this is a little startling. I'm sorry, this next is not on the handout. Goldhill sees the Goethe selection as Mary's choice for educating the monster about feelings. He says, quote, for anyone in Shelley's circle, and especially for the eloped wife of the dissolute poet, Goethe is a flag-waving selection. This is not just because he is a pioneer of romantic Hellenism. Perrin, Frankenstein's subtitle is The New Prometheus. It's not, it's the modern Prometheus. For the Shelleys, continues Goldhill, Prometheus is the iconic figure who links radicalism and Hellenism but also it's because Goethe is the anatomizer of the nature of feelings and of the relation of feelings to nature. I'm sure that's true. It does seem odd that Mary's extensive list shows only one entry at all for Goethe in 1815 for Sorrows of Young Werther, nothing about Faust. Milton, on the other hand, she had read in great depth and over time, entries from 1814 through 1822. Not surprising, since her father had edited a collection including one of the earliest biographies of John Milton. There is one entry also only for Plutarch, The Lives in 1815. What else was Mary reading in 1815? The list is truly overwhelming. It shows that she read and reread favorite works or parts of I do note with curiosity that she seemed to have been reading Alexander Pope's translations of the Iliad and Odyssey. It's fascinating to think what the monster would have made of those works in his education. She was also reading, inter alia, Edmund Burke, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Samuel Coleridge, as well as Gibbon, Ovid, Sallust, and Virgil, or parts of them. Particular factors that may have influenced her choice of Plutarch include biography, politics, and methodolo methodology. Biography, she's the daughter of a biographer. Remember that her father, Godwin, edited a collection including Milton's early biography. Mary was herself a biographer, and in fact the whole story, Frankenstein, is a kind of biography. The core narrative, creature's account of his own history, both autobiography and biography. In fact, as a student of mine pointed out to me, the work is packed with parallel lives sort of references. The parallels involving the monster, Victor, God, and Satan are too numerous to cover here. Victor and the monster have lives parallel to one another, but the monster, in fact, acts as his own parallel. As P. Clement observes in The Companion, the Godwin family gave special attention to autobiographical and biographical writings, which highlighted the inseparability of personal and historical experience. In terms of politics, Mary's parents were famous activists, and that was why, in fact, Percy Shelley was visiting them in the first place when Mary met him. And I find this very endearing. Mary's father had not wanted her to hear some of these more lurid 
conversations about galvanism, reanimation, elixir of life and all. So she did what I hope I would do or what you would do, which is hide under the couch and listen anyway and take it all in. And that seems to have been what she did. <laughs> Methodology. Mary appears to have been a notebook woman, which for some Plutarchan scholars is a very hot subject in terms of Plutarch's own methodology, how he might have used these hupomnemata. Which lives did the monster read and why did it matter? Here is the monster on the subject of his library. I've given you the entire text, which I'm not going to read, but I do want to read an excerpt because this is, this is the most important part, in my opinion. I speak in the monster's words, but not his voice. The volume of Plutarch's lives, which I possessed, contained the histories of the first founders of the ancient republics. This book had a far different effect upon me from the sorrows of Werther. I learned from Werther's imaginations despondency and gloom, but Plutarch taught me high thoughts. He elevated me above the wretched sphere of my own reflections to admire and love the heroes of past ages. Many things I read surpassed my understanding and experience. I had a very kingdoms, wide extensive country, mighty rivers, and boundless seas, but I was perfectly unacquainted with towns and like the cottage of my protectors, the Lacey family, had been the only school in which I had studied human nature, but this book developed new and mightier scenes of action. I read of men concerned in public affairs, governing or massacring their species. I felt the greatest ardor for virtue rise within me, and I say old Plutarch would have been thrilled because he tells us very clearly this is why he's writing lives, examples for us to emulate good examples, and I'm impressed that Mary had no way of knowing there is now massive bibliography on this subject, but the monster cut right to the chase. He wants to imitate these good men. Uh, you are wondering what happened, we'll get to that. He says, I felt the greatest ardor for virtue and abhorrence for vice. As far as I understood the signif signification of those terms, relative as they were, as I applied them, to pleasure and pain alone. Induced by these feelings, I was, of course, led to admire peaceable lawgivers, Numa, Solon, and Lycurgus, in preference to Romulus and Theseus. The patriarchal lives of my protectors caused these impressions to take a firm hold on my mind. Perhaps if my first introduction to humanity had been made by a young soldier burning for glory and slaughter, I should have been imbued with different sensations. It is noteworthy that the monster attributes his own reaction to the influence of the protectors who he says first gave him the books. He found these books in a leather satchel on the ground, but they clearly had belonged to his protectors and came from nearby. So he sees them in a way as a gift. In admiration for the patriarchal nature of these benefactors, he's drawn to the peaceable lawgivers, not Romulus and Theseus. There is no mention of Poplicola, who is a good man, and this seems odd to me, and it's one of the reasons I started thinking Mary, maybe Mary hadn't read all these lives, or maybe even all of them in the volume. Before I started thinking about what lives she would have available to her, I entertained myself thinking about what lives I would have chosen for the monster's favorite, and I settled on Coriolanus. I thought, here is a person exiled, reviled, you know, by his own people, and uh, Mary wasn't reading Coriolanus, so I think I have to abandon that. Other lives come to mind in terms of things that the monster might have found interesting, but he only had those six. I don't know why, we only hear about five. The monster really still has one more book. This is hand down nine, than the three just discussed. And in the interest of time, I will not read this passage to you, but you will note that this final book is notes, that when the monster fled Victor's laboratory, he grabbed Victor's lab coat, and in that coat's pocket 
were notes about the monster's creation. And this is very upsetting to him. He had not known this story. I mean, he knew he was ugly and terrible and that people hated him. But to read Victor's awful description of how he was made and what Victor thought, and, and the monster is very upset. It once again, autobiography is the last straw. It turns the monster away from his affinity for peaceable lawgivers. This is when he begins to emulate Romulus and Theseus after all, even though he had been attracted to the peaceable lawgivers. Again, here he is his own parallel life, as it were, before and after he finds his autobiography. So, I'll conclude. Mary Shelley's choice of formative reading matter for the monster, I say, was well done. The monster not only learns from the text of the parallel lives, the ones he had, but from the de Lacy family, parallel to himself. And then finally, face to face with the hitherto unknown story of his own creation, the monster directs his desire to emulate toward the dark side and he adopts the violent and hateful outlook that in others had been so painful to him. He thus becomes his own parallel and vindicates the wisdom of Shelley's choice of Plutarch for one of the monster's most influential teachers. Thank you. <laughs>